Uh, welcome to our host today, Sheila McNamee, Emerson Rosera, and Pedro Martins for their new book, um, Practicing Therapy as Social Constructions. So we're here for an hour today, and we'll just introduce myself and the Taos Institute in just a few minutes. So I'm Alex Arnold. I'm the program director at the Taos Institute. We are a nonprofit educational organization. We're completely virtual. And we offer many, many resources from opportunities to get together like this dialogue. We have uh, seminars, courses, offer lots of resources on our website, like podcasts, videos. Um, we recently, or several months ago, um, launched an online community, the Taos Institute online community. If you're not a member yet, we really join. And I would just ask that everyone stays on mute, please. If you could all mute yourselves to avoid background noise. Thank you. So the Taos online community is a space for all of you to get together. We're really creating a community where people can share resources, um, meet each other. You can, it's, it's free and open to everyone who is interested in the social constructionist, relational and appreciative ideas. So we hope that you will join us there. You can find our announcements there, recordings of our meetings and events, and many more resources. So I will not take more time than this. So Sheila, I will pass it on to you. And thank you again for being here for hosting this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And, and welcome, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces. And, and um, I'm happy you're all here. And I would just emphasize uh, what Alex said, please, please come join us on our uh, new platform, Mighty Networks. Um, we're hoping that that can be a space where we can, you know, really engage in lots of conversation and different activities and uh, really uh, produce a sort of a common space for us all. Anyway, um, so uh, Pedro Martins, Emerson Hazera, and I um, are really happy to have you here. Um, we're each going to speak a little bit about the book, um, but I want to start by giving a little bit of a sort of history, but not too much. Um, as you probably all are familiar, in 1992, uh, Ken Gergen and I edited a book called Therapy of Social Construction, and that book uh, has been translated into, I think, seven or eight languages, and it keeps, you know, circulating around the globe. And um, around 20, at the 20 year mark, I thought of um, trying to do an updated version of that book, but Sage was only interested in uh, authored books, not in edited books. And at the time, I was had too many projects to actually think about authoring a book. So fast forward to 2018, when I was in Uberlândia, Brazil, with both Emerson and Pedro, and sitting in the airport waiting for my flight, I think it was Pedro asked me, you know, why didn't you ever update therapy as social construction? So I told him the story, and we started talking, and I said, well, maybe the three of us should author an update. And so the idea was launched. And um, what we wanted to do in this book was focus on all the innovation and creativity that's emerged since 1992 and certainly there's been a lot um, and we also wanted to underscore <clears throat> a comment that we make constantly which is that therapy as social construction is not a method it's not like narrative therapy versus collaborative dialogic therapy versus solution focused therapy it's it it's a way of being therapy is social construction. So all forms of practice for us are socially constructed. And the question is, when you use a particular, uh, whether you call it a method or a school of thought, what kind of relationship are you creating? And what kind of understanding is possible when you act in one way rather than another? <clears throat> so that's kind of the premise of therapy as social construction. Now, in 1992, um, our attention was squarely focused on micro, what we call micro processes. That is the ongoing, unfolding interactions that take place in families and couples and communities. And there really wasn't much thought at the time or consideration uh, for 
therapy in the therapeutic world for larger institutional or cultural discourses and their effects on people's lives. It, it wasn't missing. It was always there in the background, but it wasn't the central focus. I think that we're, it's pretty safe to say that we were really interested in those dynamics in micro level interactions. So in this volume, <clears throat> we, what we emphasize the overall message is that it, the micro level interactions and macro level discourses are absolutely inseparable. So we, we underscore the relation between the two. Um, other authors have tried to separate these as different versions of social construction. So for example, Vivian Burr talks about light and dark social construction, which I find kind of amusing, you know, light being looking at interaction, just the way people interact, and dark looking at institutions and dominant discourses. Okay, other people refer to soft and hard versions of social construction. But for us to, to separate the micro and the macro is really to dismantle the basic argument of social construction because to separate them invites us to treat dominant discourses as if they're just simply there, they're true, they just exist with no acknowledgement of how our own everyday actions create, maintain and change dominant discourses. So that link between what we do in our micro interactions being the stuff that creates these or keeps alive or has the power to change dominant discourses. And then we treat the dominant discourses as if they're just there and that's why we act the way we do. But we have to really understand that that inseparable relation between the two. So in focusing on therapeutic practice on the micro level, you know, therapy seems to take this apolitical stance and and to the extent that we remain blind to how our micro interactions sustain or change macro level discourses, we're ignoring our own fingerprints, you know, in the creation of institutions and discourses that oppress us and others that create uh, all sorts of social injustices. And instead we walk away saying, well, that's just the way it is. So, <clears throat> We, the, that's the main thread of the book is this inseparability of the micro and the macro. And in focusing there, we take up the challenge of acknowledging uh, the existence of competing and divisive discourses. In other words, you know, uh, we're all savvy enough. We know that there's not one universal world belief or value, but so we, embrace the multiplicity of values and beliefs and truths in the in the name of macro discourses and we take up the challenge of attempting to talk about how we begin to move away from trying to reach agreements trying to adjudicate trying to decide which is right and which is wrong and instead try to somehow coordinate diversity to forge a way forward in people's lives and hopefully to um, deconstruct some of the more damaging dominant discourses that we live amongst. So the hope is to expand our discursive potential. And so in the book, uh, Practicing Therapy of Social Construction, we talk about um, moving from the what to the how of therapeutic practice um we talk about the therapeutic focus on micro processes the therapeutic focus on macro discourses contemporary challenges in therapy to therapeutic ethics and the micro macro considerations um so i'm going to pass it over to pedro who will give us a taste of the therapeutic focus on micro processes and then emerson will say something some words on the focus on macro discourses, and then our hope is to engage you in a discussion. So thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Sheila, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, as we were writing this book, uh, in addition to uh, the micro-macro 
interactions and considering how important it is to keep these two things together. We were also thinking that uh, there are so many practices, so many skilled therapists, so many authors, so many academic scholars talking about these practices all over the world. And we really, uh, we feel like for students and for our, ourselves sometimes, it might be confusing when we look to the field and how, how do these things connect? How do you connect like solution focused therapy and narrative practices and collaborative dialogic practices and social therapy? Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to do in this volume was to sort of create a, a, a map of practices and sort of try to create a narrative that would help us look at these practices and understand um, the question of what are these therapists who are informed or sensitive to the idea that therapy is a process of socially constructing a world? What do they do? What do we do when we see, we meet with our clients, when we meet with the community? So that's what we wanted to do. Uh, and we decided uh, it would be good to sort of create this map uh, into uh, different yet inseparable ways. I'm gonna talk about the therapeutic focus on micro social uh, processes, and then Emerson will talk about the macro uh, discourses, the focus on macro discourses. So when I was looking and when we were looking to these uh, variety of uh, practices, uh, which focus on conversation, on dialogue, on my own, the, therapeutic encounter, uh, we were trying to understand what do, what do we do? What do these therapists do? And instead of focusing on particular models and, and you know, presenting these models, we wanted to sort of create like arc, arcs, different arcs, where we could understand how these different practices uh, intertwine. <laughs> where do they meet each other? And in our analysis, as we looked uh, to these different practices that for, you know, that for therapists who identify themselves over this 30 years saying, I am a social constructionist, or <laughs> therapists who have never said that, but nonetheless have been identified by a community <laughs> as abiding by uh, an understanding of therapy as social construction, we were trying to understand what brings them together. And there are two main things that we have, you know, uh, understood, come to an understanding that unite uh, these therapists. I'll, I'll name the, the both of them, and then I'll just explain them a little bit to you. The first one is uh, ther these therapists, when they focus on the micro processes of therapeutically constructing a reality, they are focused on creating dialogical contexts in therapy. And the second arc is these therapists are focused on creating particular conversational resources for therapy. So I'll go with the first one. These are, uh, these are therapists who are really interested and really focused in, un in trying to understand how do we create a space, a dialogical space where change can, can be brought about. And what really struck, struck us when we were uh, looking into this was that this is a hard thing to do, and this is a very hard thing to describe. So uh, these are, uh, are people who are trying, who are really putting an effort in trying to give words to things that happen in relationship, to things that, are, that have a felt sense to them in the therapeutic setting. And many times, what they're gonna do is they're gonna come up with metaphors to try to describe the indescribable. So I have separated two of those just so for us to have an idea of what they're about. The first one is Harleen Anderson's metaphor for therapy as hosting and visiting. And she says, quote, the therapist is both a temporary host and guest in the client's life. In my teaching, I ask my students to think about how they like to be received as a guest and to describe the qualities of a good host. 
The host's posture, attitude, actions, responses, and tone must communicate to the guest their special importance as a human being who is, who is recognized and appreciated and whose stories are worth telling and hearing. And then I uh, chose Sunny Paliakas, who is based in uh, Canada, I think. And she describes therapy as a house of good words. She says, quote, imagine a house of good words. Imagine an ability to account. Such ideas press different metaphors upon me as a therapist, a rescuer of words, an apprentice, a witness, a poet, a fireworks specialist, a person with an ability to account, a wordsmith, a person intent on contributing to the foundation of possibility in others' lives, etc. So, you know, these are just two examples, but what I'm trying to say is these people are focused on saying, Therapy doesn't just happen, you know, dialogical context matters and let's try and focus on that. Let's, let's try and understand how can we create a space where change can be brought about. So this is the first, you know, set of practices and that, you know, uh, focus on micro social processes in therapy. And then the second one, uh, I think it, they're more focused on language than on relationship. And it's those therapists who will uh, describe what I call, or what we have called conversational resources for the practices. There is a, uh, an article by Arlene Katz where she describes a conversational resource as a resourceful reminder. And I really like that because uh, what a conversational resource is, it's not a technique, it's not a method, it's not you do this and then that's gonna happen. But you know, it's a reminder when you articulate your practice in a particular way, you create that practice, you offer that, so other therapists can look into the world and look into their practices using those terms. And maybe those resources can be useful to generate change. So the, sec the second focus on creating conversational resources, there's a, a, you know, a big variety of therapists who are doing very interesting things. And what we did was we described five kinds of resources that we have identified here and there in the literature. And I'm just gonna name them to you. And then Emerson, I'm gonna pass the word on to you, okay? So uh, we identified that there are those resources that for some, in one way or another, are describing phenomena in relational terms. So for these therapies, for, uh, we are living in an individualistic world. And when we as therapists start talking to our patients in relational terms instead of in individual terms, this is the resource in itself. How do we invite a construction of a more relational understanding of the world with our clients. There are many, many ways of doing that. The second set of resources are, is we've called it playing with words. And these are therapists who are really interested in how words matter and how if we're attentive to, uh, how did that word come uh, to existence in this conversation? What's the history behind that word? Or as Tom Anderson, Tom Anderson would say, if you unpack that word, what do you see in that? They are really interested in creating resources, conversational resources that will help us play with words. The third set is called focusing on potentials. And in different ways, these therapists, uh, they come from a premise that problem talk is not always necessary to create change. So how can we move our focus towards potentials? The fourth one, we have called it creating connections. And this is based on the social constructionist premise that we cannot be ourselves alone. And so if that's the case, how can we as therapists help our clients create better connections in their worlds, strengthen their connections with their communities, with their families, with the important people that can make a difference in their lives. And finally, uh, the last set of resources is called questioning the taken for granted. And these are resources that will help therapists focus on 
the taken for granted in people's lives. And there are many things that we take for granted, including the micro the micro social discourses, which our problems in our lives are embedded in. So these therapists are interested in talking to uh, their clients in ways that will invite them to look with suspicion to the taken for granted ways that they have come to understand their lives. And so this is the last set of uh, resources. Of course, there is, when we look at this you know, umbrella, <laughs> there are many, many, many different therapies and many, many different resources. And that's what we were trying to uh, show as a, a map, sort of a map in this chapter. Emerson. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us at this dialogue with author session. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Sheila and Pedro, for sharing some ideas from our book. Um, I would like to contribute to this conversation by focusing on the ma macro social discourses. I would like to very briefly present different ways of understanding therapy as transformative social practice. Uh, to begin with, I would like to recognize that many social constitutionalist authors invite us to look at how social macro processes are present in the daily life of therapy. That is, how cultural, political, economic processes contribute to the emergence of problems that lead people to therapy, as well as enable or prevent certain modes of coping and care. They invite the therapists into reflective, self-critical stance and encourage the production of alternative ways of conducting therapy and that address and challenge some macro-social discourses. So how can therapy be socially transformative? Uh, for our objective today, I want to highlight seven ways of doing that inside and beyond the consultation room. Uh, as Sheila and Pedro already said, they're not models, they're inspirations for practice. Um, and I will, <laughs> I have some notes here. I wanna cop and paste them on the chat. So uh, on the chat, we will find the list of seven ways of understanding and developing therapy as a social transformative practice. I will briefly comment uh, each of them. So the first one, talking about inequalities and oppression. Uh, what kind of conversations are these? Uh, they are conversations that consider social inequalities, avoid a view of problem as located within the individual and recognize the different possibilities for all involved according to their social place. These conversations, they create spaces for clients to identify these oppressions and create ways to relieve them. There are some ways to promote these conversations, such as investigating the moments when clients report experienced and understood by them as unfair. Exploring the family, for example, when you're in a family, exploring the division of tasks in the family, recognizing imbalances uh, and how they connect with social expectations and standards. Discussing, for example, how social discrimination is part of the suffering reported by clients. And also analyzing how social discourses contribute to the production of problems. So the first one is really invite people to talk about inequalities and social injustice and oppression. The second way is promoting socially just practice through dialogue. This, this approach privileges the knowledge of the participants, valuing their ways of describing and understanding themselves, as well as the social processes, inequalities they encounter. But here, the focus is on dialogue. And these authors warn us to not colonize or impose an agenda of social oppression or injustice in the therapeutic conversation. This way of working invites the therapist to permanently reflect on some questions like, 
how the language of oppression and injustice expands or restricts the possibilities of the therapeutic conversation. For whom and when is this language useful in the therapeutic process? How to create a reflective space so that therapy does not inadvertently reproduce the system of injustice? You see, these are two ways to balance our uh, desire to talk about inequality and social oppression. And the third way is a more practical one, very pragmatic, is that uh, offering practical help for people in vulnerable situations. Some examples are, for example, uh, review session fees for patients in financial difficulty, assist clients to identify social and community resources to face the, the difficulties experienced by them, such as government and non-government services, and offer letters of reference and facilitate contact and access to other services. These uh, three first ways of doing therapy such as transformative practice, they are usually developed inside the consultation room. Now we talk about some uh, that could be developed beyond the consultation room. Uh, the fourth one, or the first one of this second group, is promoting connections within the community. Working within the community can be an antidote to the ever-present risk of individualization and psychopathologizing of the problems brought to us. Listening to people in the community facilitates the process of recognizing shared problems and the social, political, and economic marks of the suffering. Likewise, community practices contribute to the transformation of the community itself as they create opportunities for the resources to be then and become available for their members. They also allow the valorization of popular traditional culture and knowledge, which inform the best ways of organizing the conversation and become part of the form of understanding and problem solving. We don't have time here to go through all these practices, but I just wanna give two examples of how to connect with the community. Uh, when we think about the open dialogue, developed by SACLA and colleagues in our way. And also when we think about integrative community therapy developed by Grandesso and colleagues here in Brazil. These are two ways, uh, they develop different ways of organizing the conversations within the community and they can inspire practices. The fifth way of developing uh, therapy as a transformative social practice is offering alternatives to the management of social conflicts based on therapeutic approaches. Uh, so in addition to different forms of therapeutic care for clients in distress, therapists can contribute to a more just, egalitarian and peaceful society by constructing proposals for the collective confrontation of social problems. Wow. Therapists use their knowledge to understand psychosocial challenges and create forms of intervention that can be useful for their transformation. A great illustration here is the Public Conversations Project. They invite people from opposing groups to talk together, to avoid debate and to promote dialogue, to avoid mutual destruction and promote mutual understanding. And the sixth uh, way of uh, doing it is producing alternative discourses that resist oppression. If you understand that we make sense of the world from the available social discourses and that many of those discourses generate suffering and exclusion, therapies can contribute to a socially transformative practice as, that, as they collaborate in the production of new social discourses. However, what discourses should be produced? Who should dictate the production process and content? In order to avoid the traps of specialized knowledge, Clients are seen as a fundamental partner in the production of social discourses. They know the details of the impact of certain social discourses on the production of suffering on a daily basis. In the same way, they know how to face these discourses, how to resist them, how to summon reinforcement for their confrontation, and how to decrease their power. At illustration, there are two practices developed by narrative therapists that can illustrate how to produce this local and alternative knowledge with clients. And here I say about the leagues 
and collective documents. These are public archives with interviews, diaries, poems, drawings from clients based on live knowledge of their suffering and how to receive them. This knowledge can be used for other people, other clients around the world as they access uh, these kind of documents. Another practice of producing alternative discourse by therapists and their clients that the resist oppression and suffering can be seen in the hearing voices movement. Uh, that is an depathologizing effort toward what it means to hear voices. They want us to see it as a cultural phenomenon and not a symptom that should be eliminated. And the last but not least, stimulating the political participation of therapists and clients. Therapists can play an important role in creating public policies and in defending clients' rights. Specifically, uh, therapists can contribute to policies directly related to the populations with which they work. Given their theoretical training and practical experience, therapists are especially equipped to promote policies aimed at meeting needs and respecting the specifics of their clients. How to do that? By voting, by advocating for client rights, lobbying for collective issues, witnessing in public hearings, being activists in groups that defend or protest about some public policies. And this form of political action by therapists also represents an invitation to clients' political participation. In this sense, a political sensitive listening can help the therapist to recognize such a problem shared by the participants and open space for forms of political engagement by clients. Among these different forms of connecting clients are connecting clients with other people and organizations that, that face similar problems and also promoting clients' involvement and social action and advocacy. Some final words uh, for this brief comment. Uh, I would like to talk about therapeutic activism and social justice. The debate in this book uh, sought to show how a politically sensitive social constructionist press is possible. Constructionist relativism does not mean the impossibility of acting politically. On the contrary, it invites people to take responsibility for ways of living in our society. The various practices illustrated here are not models or prescriptions for how to act. They should serve us as ways to stimulate therapy's imagination and creating local responses to building common good. Therapy's activism is above all the commitment to take a stand in relation to the various projects of community life, either as part of daily work with different clients or in the use of their knowledge and skills for the transformation of social life. So I'd like to thank you all for your generous listening to these ideas. And um, we are now open for questions and comments. Right, Sheila, Pedro? Yeah. Uh, thank you, both Pedro and Emerson, and thank you to all of you for being here and listening. I just want to throw out a couple of, of thoughts and uh, in, invite you to uh, post a question in the chat or a comment or um, just be ready to speak out. But one of the things I wanted to underscore is in this book, you know, we really I'm not sure that it's explicit, but certainly uh, a byproduct of, of how we put this together is really challenging the vision of therapy as something that takes place in a consultation room only. And um, acknowledging also that there is a really important political dimension to everything we do as therapists. Um, and a third thing that is questioned of called into question then, of course, is the relationship between the therapist and the client in terms of some of the um, more macro level uh, issues that Emerson raised, where you might see a therapist actually um, engaging in political protest with clients. Uh, 
uh, for purposes of changing legislation around some issue related to social justice. Um, so there it, it, really a lot of what we have traditionally thought about in, in terms of therapy is um, opened up in a different way. And the other thing I want to say is we know, you know, a lot of us have written or talked about the problems with the medical model of therapy. And there's certainly a plethora of, of, um, of books on that topic. But here, when we talk about practicing therapy as social construction, we really are, instead of taking on that same argument of just saying there's problems with the medical model, this is more uh, future looking, I would say, more um, resourceful, I hope, what we've written, uh, and looking at some of the really hard cases like homelessness, trauma, suicide, um, uh, substance misuse, all these issues, you know, to look at them in much broader cultural, global, and social uh, venues so that, um, I, and I think that that's a, becoming for me personally, a more powerful argument than just the same old argument about the problems with the medical model, because that argument has been around for a long time and not a whole lot has changed. So can we show some examples of, and, and Emerson has, in the book, personal examples of of taking political action with clients and doing this sort of work. So um, it's really inspiring to me. So um, Pedro Emerson, do you want to add any of your own reflections or shall we just open it to others? I think that I'm curious about what people are thinking of what we told, you know, I think that we could engage in some conversation conversation and sharing comments. I am really eager to, to listen to people that are here uh, with us today, Sheila, for now. You know, I have many ideas, but I want to listen to people <laughs> for now. Yeah. Okay. So I invite you to uh, come, come forward with your reflections, questions, comments. Hello, I've got a I've got a thought. If that's okay. Thanks, Glenn. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm struck by what I'm hearing from you guys, um, and I've only read the first chapter that was sent through by Alex. There felt like um, a connection with hope, which I thought was inspiring, and um, it, it feels a quite contrary to the kind of worldview of hopelessness <laughs> that's spinning around us and that we're in. And I'll just, I'll just, I don't know, it's just a reflection that, um, and I was interested in your thoughts about the, um, whether or not we could apply the ideas of social constructionism to your position with hope and the, in context of a tsunami of hopelessness. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I I was going to say if be, before you said talked about hopelessness, I was going to say yeah, it's we're surrounded by all these challenges, and yet I do think that um, you know if you think about social construction as a way of being in the world, you know, not a technique, not a method, but a way of being, um, it, we do have resources, and that's what you know uh, Pedro was talking about, you know the different ways of talking about the resources, not this uh, specific techniques, but ways of being that open possibilities rather than close down. And it is like enormously uh, frustrating to live in the world with so much divisiveness and so just so much um, violence evil hatred um but the question is what can we do what small steps could can we take to make a difference there and and in that for me there's hope um 
I would love to say, you know, could change the whole world overnight, but, you know, of course, uh, at the Taos Institute, we say we change the world one conversation at a time. And so um, that's the best we can do. And and I think for me in, in working with Pedro and Emerson on this book, um, kind of a wave of relief overcame me in thinking we don't have to as as people in helping professions, we don't have to be apolitical, be neutral. We can absolutely respect different political positions, different values and beliefs, while simultaneously not hiding our own. And I think that um, knowing how to do that delicately is the key. And I and hopefully we've offered some ways to do that in this book. Emerson, Pedro, yeah. Yeah, I would just like to add that uh, the way you put this, Glenn, it really moved me when I heard <laughs> the word uh, hope. And uh, if I could, I would just give an emphasis on that, <laughs> rewrite the book and give an emphasis on that somewhere. <laughs> so thank you for that. I'm going to keep thinking about it for a while. And I just wanted to say that uh, as a therapist, I, I talk to many people, other colleagues, and it's really, you know, if you are politically uh, implicated, if you're thinking about the world, <laughs> you're bound to suffer. <laughs> and I think that uh, we have to create ways to not be paralyzed by that suffering because otherwise it's just gonna be unbearable. Uh, and so when we put that book together and we create conversations like this, I just wanted to say that this gives me hope, you know, uh, when I see that I'm not alone, when I feel like there are people who resonate with these ideas, that there are other people who actually care. So I think that's also a way of, you know, bringing forth and really performing the basic idea of social constructionism, which is we don't do anything alone. We need others to be ourselves. So how can we connect with those others and how can we uh, strengthen those relationships in order to keep creating hope? So thank you for that. Renee, hello. Or Emerson, did you want to respond first? I'm sorry. No, just thank you, Glenn. And I agree with uh, what Sheila and Pedro uh, said. And I think that uh, together we can make changes and together we suffer less and together we feel better. I don't think it's about being optimist or pessimist, but I think hope's part of our work. We have to have some hope uh, to keep going on, to keep doing things. And when we do that together, I think it's a better way of doing that. It's not a prescription, it's just an invitation uh, for how to do things, because if you understand that everything is socially constructed, then what's the social here? And, and we are not alone. And then let's invite people to join us together to do, you know, the changes that are one, I think, uh, that are important in our local communities. But thank you, Glenn. I think it's very inspiring, this question. Hene, please. Tell us what you're thinking. Hi, guys. I was thinking about, um, well, first of all, Glenn, this, this uh, observation was very inspiring for all of us. And uh, you reminded me of Dan Tomasulo's book about learned hopefulness. And it's a great book uh, to, to reflect or to deconstruct hope. And uh, I was thinking how uh, this, uh, this, type of work is a response or we're we're moving forward with society with uh there's lots of people that are also uh moving towards a more socially constructive way of going forward into the world and we live in a, like i like i see it i see lots of people that are uh you know make, making the work in other places other than therapy other than uh, psychology other than social constructionism but they're doing they're going outside within all of these different fields and and just 
we're all living in a postmodern world. So we're just moving forward with them. And we're just, you know, like uh, uh, finding ways to engage because society is already postmodern in lots of ways. And there's lots of people uh, really pushing forward the edge. Uh, uh, and we're just doing it from our stance as, as therapists, as psychologists, as uh, communicators such as Sheila. But um, I think that this is just a response of us moving forward with society because there's lots of uh, movements around arts and sciences and uh, within, uh, you know, even in politics and everything that they're moving forward this. So we're just stepping up. I think that's what we're doing. Yeah, thanks, Renee. I, I really like you raising that point because uh, just last night I was reading uh, I was asked to review an article for a journal. So, and I'm reading this article and it's drawing all these distinctions between constructivism and constructionism and this person's version and that person's version and that person. And, you know, I just wanted to say, hey, we're all working towards the same thing here. And, um, and it, you know, what we call it doesn't really matter there, but you're absolutely right. There's just so much innovation and creativity in creating more livable futures happening in the world. Um, and it's a shame that oftentimes we are, are not aware of it or we don't see that, we, we just see the problem. So um, we need to elevate each other, I think. Yeah, thank you for bringing that. Kermit, hi. Hi. Um, what's coming to my mind is I, I have, you know, experienced being depleted by being engaged in, you know, the political um, and other, you know, struggles related to what, related to therapy in particular. Feeling, you know, I struggled with the field uh, as feeling like sort of, you know, an inevitable tool of you know, the existing economic and power and identity structures. Um, it's just very, you know, even the engagement with the issues there feels like, you know, can feel like a, just a, you know, a reifying those structures. And I've, I've really struggled around that mm -hmm. and, and just wanting to step out of the field completely. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this conversation, what I'm realizing about that, or the, what came to mind early in the conversation is that, you know, tragedy is a function of, of a fixed moment of time. And that once you can step out of that, uh, it can become all kinds of other things. I mean, it, because that, the fixed moment of time is constellated in terms of, you know, specific causalities, et cetera. And if you step out of that, then all of a sudden, you know, you're into a different world, uh, including one that has humor. You know, as you know, the old comedy is tragedy plus time. I've been thinking about that a lot, and uh, and the new thought that I'm having about that is is just simply the addition of of time or or, or timelessness. Mm -hmm. And so, in this conversation, what I'm what I'm realizing is that for myself, it's a particularly political act in therapy, or you know, in that. In a, in, a, in a therapeutic relationship, however that comes about, to actually step out of time completely and you know, step out of the moment, the political moment, mm. all of it, and, and just try to try to introduce timelessness. Um, which, by the way, is why I made my background. I am, I'm currently in the Great Library of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. uh, which I called that up because I looked at Sheila's books and I wanted to one up her. Uh, <laughs> um, but I'm realizing in the moment that, you know, that that also has to do with how I'm thinking about all of this. It's just like, you know, figure out how to step out of this moment completely, which is ironic, you know, when we're, we're talking about is how to be political. I guess what I'm trying to say is it's a particularly political thing to say this moment is not the defining one for any mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some interesting reflections, Kermit. Um, you know, I'm thinking of how we 
often use future questions about the future, you know, to, I mean, time is, can be always part of our work with clients or, you know, whether it's in therapy or in education or healthcare or wherever, um, that opens a space of sorts. You know, it's, I don't think we, for example, we would ever step out of tragedy. I think we just, it slides into to different understandings. Um, it's, whatever it is is still there but it gets reconstructed and deconstructed continually but um and then i i was wondering emerson if you have thoughts because you know like take do, taking some it is tiresome to be political and it's it's you often feel defeated and depleted um is there humor emerson in, in being political Thank you, Kermit. Thank you, Arthur, for your comment. And um, I don't know how to talk about time and political action. In my experience, uh, uh, we're not talking about future. We're talking about uh, how to live our everyday life now. And just to share uh, an experience that I had, for many years, I worked with people living with HIV AIDS here in Brazil. And there was a time, I don't know if you know that, but in Brazil, all the treatment is for free. People go to the public services and they get all the medicines and the treatments they need. And I was uh, facilitating a group for people living with HIV AIDS at that time. And what happened, it was, uh, they were not getting the medicine there was a delay in the supply of the medicine and patients they were very worried about that because they were supposedly you know they have to take the medicines every day in order to get the bad results uh, for their treatment so being in the group and trying to have this political listening uh, what happened is that clients they were together talking about this problem and then I invite them to, to talk about what we could do together in that situation. And then they began a conversation of how uh, talking with the coordinator of the HIV program uh, in the city, uh, what could be done in order you know, to avoid this kind of delay. Uh, in the group, you know, there were some people that were into doing that, there were some people that were not uh, feeling comfortable of doing that kind of action. And at that time, you know, the discrimination around being HIV positive, it's still uh, huge, but at the time it was immense. So some people are not comfortable of doing political and public actions, but part of this group, they were. And then, you know, they asked for a meeting with this coordinator and then they established this channel of communication with them. And then things began to change for their own treatment. So uh, they were uh, fighting for their rights at, uh, on that moment. They're not actually thinking about the future exactly, but how uh, to be alive and they were needing these medicines. So, uh, but you know, and then afterward, some months after that, they decided that they want to um, create a non-government organization, you know, created by, led by, and offering services for uh, age, people living with HIV AIDS. So I think that uh, what we can do is an invitation to be together and not understand the problems we face just as if they were, you know, a result of some personal problem, but they're connected to the social with just to this uh, society that we live in, you know, all the economic differences uh, that we have and how we can address that. And I think that uh, it's a way to avoid the psychopathization of social problems and people can do things together. And they create what is uh, the best way for they do that. And, and then the future becomes the present, you know? Uh, but um, there are times that are hard, you know? 
To be together talking about discrimination is not an easy thing. To be isolated because of this discrimination is a very hard feeling, a very hard a challenge to faith. And, uh, but you know, I think this is the thing, is to be together, uh, trying to not just change ourselves and our ways of uh, understanding the world, but trying to change the world, you know, a little bit in the direction that we have. Uh, I think this is the invitation and, you know, let's be together and open ourselves for these possibilities. I think that invitation is the book is to, you know, invite people to be open for new ways of acting when we're thinking about a political action, you know, traditional political action, because I think everything's political, but you're talking this, you know, traditional political action. Uh, sorry, you know, I lost myself in these comments, but thank you, Karen. Thank you, Sheila. No, that's a good example. Thanks, Emerson. Can I, Sheila, can I pick up here? Because I wanted to connect Kermit's uh, comment to something that I was reading in the chat, uh, to Julie's uh, comment and also Yost's uh, response. Uh, one thing that I really like about these practices is that they provide us with options. So uh, when Kermit talks about stepping out of time, this is one thing that I've learned that I really like to do is if this conversation, if this way of working, if this way of interacting is not working right now or is not creating the effects that we want, we have options. <laughs> How might we coordinate differently? So I feel like that's a that's a really big potential. And uh, Julie's uh, comment, she's saying that relational processes feel natural to her, but sometimes we will be confronted with uh, the more traditional uh, ethical prescriptions of our professions and uh, how do we deal with that when they seem so clinical and distant and and i was thinking about uh, one of the chapters in our book uh which is chapter six and how some many times we have been using our ethic codes to protect ourselves or more to protect ourselves as professionals like i am doing what the i am abiding by the book than by actually then to actually practice in an ethical manner <laughs> and what i what this conversation makes me think is it can be really frustrating <laughs> to uh, be confronted with everyday uh, uh conversations and just having to feel like is this part of that book is this ethical is this not in the sense of a prescriptive ethics and we know that the profession will demand that but i'm also feeling and Yost's uh comment helps me think of that that it can be liberating <laughs> to feel like what are to ask ourselves why are these ethical uh, prescriptions here in the first place and they're not here to protect us <laughs> from, you know, uh, having a problem uh, in the justice or in the justice system or everything. They're here to remind us that the most important thing is to preserve relationships, is to create ways of relating that are respectful, that uh, give the others, um, you know, a right to exist. And I think that sometimes... <laughs> This is going to be deemed unethical, depending on the code that you're looking at. But you know, I think the best practices once were. We've run out of time. And I know that there are some questions in the chat that um, we haven't addressed. Uh, maybe we'll try to follow up on those. But um, I like ending on this idea of uh, ethics and I like to refer to a relational ethic as an ethic of discursive potential, that it opens up possibilities for ourselves and for the people we work with. So I thank you all for being here. I thank Pedro and Emerson for being my collaborators on this project. Couldn't have done it without you. Um, and um, I, I would love to keep the conversation going. So thank you, everyone.
Yes, thank you for being here. Thank you, Pedro, Emerson, and Sheila uh, for hosting this dialogue with the authors. And the recording will be available. It will be in our online community. This is also a place where uh, in the event page, you can comment and continue the conversation, ask your questions and, um, and engage in dialogue so we can keep this, this going. So thank you so much for being here and we will see you soon.